Hey guys, welcome back to another video. Just a quick update today about Nanox. There was some news that was released indicating that they had submitted their 510K submission to the FDA uh, for clearance of the Nanox ARC, that is the multi-source unit. Uh, so in my last video, I said, hey, they need to get on the ball and get moving. And I probably did not stir them to do that, but nevertheless, they got on the ball and got it submitted. So we'll talk about that today. We'll talk about what this 510K submission process looks like and what we could expect for a timeline. And then uh, just some other brief updates about Nanox from their Jeffries Healthcare Conference that they did earlier this month. Stay tuned. All right, the 510K submission. What took so long? Looking for a predicate device. And what is a predicate device? That is a medical device that has already been cleared by the FDA, which is substantially equivalent to the product that is being submitted for a new 510K clearance. That took Nanox a long time. We don't actually know what the predicate device was that was selected. Nevertheless, they found one and they have submitted that today, June 17th. What will happen now with this process? The FDA has a very nice website which outlines the 510K clearance process. We're going to run down to a graphic that we'll use as a template for this discussion. So day one of this process starts when the FDA receives the 510K submission. The FDA will then have seven days to provide an acknowledgement letter. All this says is, hey, we've received your 510K submission, essentially. Or potentially they could put it on hold if there are unresolved issues such as uh, no user fee or there's no electronic copy. After that, then hopefully within 15 days, the FDA will complete their acceptance review. Now, this is just simply run by a checklist, and it really is just a checklist. This is the document that they use. The purpose of the document states that it is to explain the procedures and criteria that the FDA intends to use in assessing whether a pre-market notification submission meets a minimum threshold of acceptability. This is just the submission, the paperwork end of it, essentially. They do review the uh, device that's being submitted to make sure it's being submitted under the proper device category, etc. Going further down in the document, it states the purpose is to assess whether a submission is administratively complete and that it includes all of the information necessary for the FDA to conduct a substantive review. And here's just an example of that checklist, and you see that it says preliminary questions, and it has a check mark, yes, no, and they run through this whole thing, which has about 43 items to check off. So the results of this acceptance review are that it's either accepted and can move on to the substantive review, or it's placed on refuse to accept hold, and will indicate some reasons why it's been refused to accept and Nanox would have to resolve those issues. Once they get past the acceptance review, then we're looking at a substantive review. The goal of that is to have that complete by day 60. The substantive review goes into far more depth. The results of that will be that there will either be an interactive review with the submitter or the lead reviewer will make a request for additional information. If that additional information request happens, the 510K clearance is automatically put on hold for up to 180 days, and Nanox would have 180 days to resolve that. If they don't, then their 510K submission is considered null and void, and they would have to restart. The FDA has a goal of, within 90 days, making a decision that the product is either substantially equivalent or non-substantially equivalent, if it receives that substantially equivalent, which is, off, which is abbreviated SE in their documents, then that is essentially considered cleared. What happens if this Nanox arc does not receive the substantially equivalent label? Well, the FDA outlines what will happen. Nanox can either resubmit it under 510K with new data, or they can request class one or two designation through the de novo classification. Uh, they could file a reclassification petition or they could submit a pre-market approval application. Those processes take much longer. So the 510K route is definitely the quicker. Now I gave you that timeline. That is the ideal timeline, but not necessarily the practical timeline. This data is a little bit old, but it gives a good example of how long the FDA actually takes to get these items cleared. So if we go back to 2016, we see that only 19% of 510K submissions were cleared within 90 days. 
86% were cleared within nine months, and 95% were cleared within 12 months. Additionally, again from some older data, but it does help emphasize the point, these are devices based upon the type of device submitted. So we see anesthesiology took about 245 days. You can look here at the rest of them. We'll get down to the relevant one, which is radiology, and that was 112 days. So we see that 90 days really is the ideal, but we should not expect this 90 days. And really, with some of the COVID slowdowns, uh, I, I think that this could easily stretch out well beyond 180 days. We're going to finish our discussion with just a quick synopsis of the Jeffries Healthcare Conference that their CEO, Rand Poliakin, made. He emphasized that the chip is the technology. Of course, the chip contains the nanocarbon tubes, and those tubes are used to uh, create electrons, which will then uh, help to create x-rays. This slide here just outlines uh, some of that pathway to get to this point. This slide here also just demonstrates this path creating the nanox source. That's the source for uh, the electrons, which will subsequently be used uh, within the nanox tube to create x-rays. Of course, those tubes go into their nanox arc. This will have five of these x-ray tubes in here. And then the images that are produced by this nanox arc will be uploaded into the nanox cloud. This device is intended to substantially lower the existing cost of medical imaging. In fact, there are relatively few moving parts on this equipment. The patient will be positioned on this table and the Nanox arc itself will move along the table. So this is the moving uh, part along this equipment, the arc. He talked about keeping the production of the Nanox chip uh, to themselves. They don't want to let a third party be doing this. They are building a new uh, fab site in South Korea that is expected to be operational in mid-2022. In the meantime, they have rented a clean room within another facility where they can produce the chips for themselves. Now, as far as the x-ray tubes go, they are turning that over to third-party suppliers. They have both a ceramic and a glass type being produced. And at economy of scale, they're estimating that this can be done for $100 per x-ray tube. As far as the Nanox Arc goes, they are producing those through a third party. They are making enough of them right now that these can start to be distributed for learning how to use the device. We'll just finish this discussion with what does the time like look like now then for this company. I've already outlined the 510K clearance, of course. That is the rate limiting step in all of this. In the meanwhile, they're continuing their manufacturing ramp up and they will continue to build their leadership team. We're looking out to 2022 for the first shipments of the Nanox Arc. Uh, they're looking initially to try to get out about 5,000 of those with 15,000 deployed worldwide by the year 2024. All right, that's it for Nanox update on June 17th. 510K submission has occurred. We will watch and see how the timeline proceeds. And we obviously know that 90 days is not practical. I'm thinking at least 180 days, although their CEO in a previous presentation did say 120 days is what he expected. Now, one thing that I didn't emphasize is that this submission was going directly to the FDA this time. Last time they used a third party reviewer uh, to try to get the Nanox cart done. And in a previous presentation, Mr. Poliakin said they're skipping the third party reviewer this time straight to the FDA. If you enjoyed this video, please give us a thumbs up. If you didn't enjoy the video, Give us a thumbs up anyway, please, and feel free to leave some comments. I already know that there will be some, though, that will be negative, which I'm okay with, and some will be derogatory. If that's the way you like it, go ahead. Until next time, enjoy your investing.